So, <clears throat> without any further ado, I would start by addressing um, a first uh, a first question uh, to to uh, today's panelists. And um, the first one would be, what do you think is the potential impact uh, of a switch in the business model of Russian energy companies from a low volume, high price approach to a high volume, moderate price one? And uh, what do you think uh, are the economic prerequisites for, for this to, to happen as well? And uh, with your permission, I'd like first to ask uh, uh, Mr. Oguchu to take on this, uh, this first question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If you allow me, I'd like to say a couple of words about what I mean by reform, and because this is the main theme of our session. I think reform means different things in different contexts and different countries. And um, therefore, it's difficult to reach a common definition of reform. And in our industry, in energy sector, um, we often uh, fail to understand the true dimensions of what comprehensive energy management is, because energy policy cannot be treated in isolation from other policy areas. It has close connotation with taxation, competition, trade, financial system, markets, governance, then I'm not talking even about foreign and security policy issues as well, which are closely connected to uh, energy. And also, Reform means different things to producing countries and different things to consuming countries or transit countries. And at the international level as well, so you have international governance reform, like how to incorporate a huge energy power like China in the international system, be in IEA or International Energy Forum or uh, Energy Charter. And... Um, uh, also how to deal a country like Russia and OPEC, non-OPEC countries. So there are so many issues to cover. And my personal impression is that whenever energy prices are high, let's take it for oil, for example, oil prices are high, and we forget about the reforms because treasures, treasuries and uh, coffers, treasury coffers are full of uh, petrodollars, and they don't need to think about the reforms. Look at the uh, Arab nations in the Middle East as well. You know, once uh, the oil price is moving above $100, and they don't have to worry. And then you have also resource nationalism. That means you know, they want to tax the profits that IOCs are making, saying, that, well, this is our resources, and we have to share uh, upside and risk together. And I witnessed this personally in my uh, business life when I was with BG Group in Kazakhstan. I can tell you because it's now public knowledge. And we invested heavily there because we had a contract for to 2038. And once we started making excessive in their waves uh, profit, and they started to ask for more equity without paying. And if you don't accept that, then resource nationalism expressed as environmental fines, tax audits, and you name it. So the message there is, uh, there are always rainy days and good days. So if you treat me well in rainy days, I will also treat you as an investor in good days. So this is a key message to producing countries that you have to treat your investor so well because you never know this ups and downs. You will need this. You are in a marriage over a long period of time. If you don't look after your partner, fiance, or wife, and you will be in trouble in future when conditions get tough. And um, so uh, this is on the, when the oil prices come down to, you know, as we experienced, almost to $40, there's a panic. Everybody is in search of reforms. And they go to the, their dusty shelves and bring back all these reform blueprints and proposals that they had from international organizations or whoever prepared it. And so they are trying to maximize the efficiency, resource efficiency, energy efficiency, and also organizational efficiency in their countries so that they can survive in these circumstances. They go through their tax reforms, competition policy reforms, and open arm policy for investors. They love investors at that time because they need it uh, more than ever. And uh, so, therefore, reforms changes uh, according to prices, according to times, and 
For our purposes, we discuss in the morning, you also mentioned about the game changers in world energy, not only in energy, of course, game changers we experience in financial flows, geopolitics, economic power shift, you name it, but in energy also there are significant game changers in terms of changing demand and uh, supply map of the world and the investment requirements and declining levels of investment, technology transfer, geopolitical, whatever. And so what our countries, especially in emerging market economies, need to do is how to adapt to the consequences of these game-changing developments. Otherwise, you will be living in a dream world without any relevance to the reality. And Russia represents such a case right now, in my personal opinion, a little bit. They haven't really woken up to what's happening in the world. And they are stick, still sticking to their uh, high prices, although they negotiate, uh, offering some uh, insignificant discounts. And uh, perhaps they need to learn from Saudi Arabia during the low oil prices. We observe that to Asia Pacific customers, they offered significant discounts because they didn't want to lose market share. They didn't mind about losing revenue, but to keep the market share. Whereas in Russian case now, because of the high prices they still maintain relatively, they might be risking losing the market share. And it's already going to happen as we see from the developments, be in LNG markets, be in uh, competing pipeline projects that will come uh, onshore and become operational quite soon. Also, domestically, Russia is in a mess. And uh, there's no longer a problem about the shortage of supplies. Independents are working very well, you know, from Rosneft to Novatek and others uh, against Gazprom and they might be even exceeding the Gazprom performance in many ways, but they don't have access, third-party access for exporting uh, to uh, high-value international markets. Also, within Russia, of course, pricing, subsidies, and rehabilitation of domestic pipelines and infrastructure, and heavy-handed interference in the decisions of corporate world by Kremlin. So these are critical issues. Plus, using energy as a uh, weapon uh, in their relations uh, with neighbors and their markets. And, but this is also working now the other way around. The Russians are telling me that, well, now the West is using energy as a weapon as well through the sanctions. And so if energy is going to become uh, a relatively non-politicized uh, commodity uh, flowing between you know, demand and supply countries through transit or what, and I think it's important that the countries, uh, especially producing and transit countries, need to be following more soft power diplomacy in energy. Because heavy-handed approach and flexing the political military muscles, as we see in the Caspian, in South China Sea, and vis-a-vis -vis Russia, Ukraine, August 2008, Georgia, and Iranian approach, uh, I think this is not very conducive to a healthy flow of energy and regional energy integration that we all look. So there is a need for a level of maturity uh, in this regard. And uh, another, I think, key issue is transparency in the energy industry. EITI, you might be familiar with that, Extractive Industries uh, Transparency Initiative, that try to improve transparency and have the funds received by governments from operating companies use domestically where so that uh, host countries and also operating com companies are transparent, accountable uh, to their uh, constituencies. And there's a long way to go in that, especially in our region as well. Though, I mean, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, they sign up to EITA, but there are always ways of loopholes to uh, get away from that. And corruption, bribery, uh, are not only distorting uh, these countries' uh, economic development, sustainable development, and, but also it's distorting competition, or also interaction with the rest of the world. So it's very harmful, but you can't eradicate it. We recognize that. But at least you can reduce the room for uh, further corruption and bribery. So good governance is very important. And... Um, 
Also, I think in the energy world, uh, institutional governance is emerging as a critical factor. And um, because uh, you usually have NOCs dominating the energy industry, be it KMG, Sokar, Gazprom, uh, Rome Petrol, or whatever, um, or Kurdish uh, ministry de facto is working as an NOC or SOMO. And there, the room for um, good governance and corporate governance, uh, better pra best practices are huge. So much resources have been wasted there. China, you, you, you've been talking about it. Uh, whatever happens, China will affect us eventually. It's not like in the past, 30 years ago. Now, China is the world's largest energy consumer and uh, also largest carbon dioxide emitter in the world and the largest trading ration in the world, second largest economy in the world. So the Chinese economic development model based on more state capitalism and a bit crony capitalism as well, will determine the way they are consuming energy, the way they are going to connect with Central Asia, Myanmar, with Gulf and Caspian, Russia, this you know, uh, the mega deal, $400 billion with Russia uh, for Irkutsk, uh, power of Siberia, then Altai pipeline. And uh, therefore, uh, I think the institutional governance framework that we are adopting is very important. President Xi Jinping launched a purge at the top leadership level of all NOCs, Sinopec, CMPC, Sinoc, uh, Sinocam. They all lost their CEOs and uh, chairs. There's a new team now because Chinese wasted billions of dollars for investing overseas and also and domestically. So that's a critical issue for all of us. And the other factor, among all of course, our friend Asad might say more about this, uh, the business climate, investment climate. These countries that we are talking about require billions of dollars. I was mentioning about $48 trillion between now and 2035 needed for energy investment. Where will this money come from? Not the state investment or IFI investment. It has to come from the private sources, basically. The others could be just seed money provided to facilitate uh, these investments. And private money will not flow unless you improve the business environment. Business environment being you know, the financial system, uh, transparency, business integrity, uh, tax policy, competition policy, and uh, open trading and non-discrimination, all these issues are critical elements. And so I want to come back what I said about the uh, treating your investors and operators. If you don't treat them well today, and in rainy days you will not find them. They will go to where the rate of return is higher, where they are most welcome, where investment climate is better. Not just because you have beautiful eyes, they will stay and uh, be uh, loyal to you or obedient to your interests, just like in you know, personal relationship, uh, human relationships. And so Russia now, I think, is recognizing the importance of these reforms. But in my opinion, Ukraine is doing better than Russia in terms of realizing, because you know, I've been involved with the Ukrainian reform process since early 1990s. Since then, the, it was a miracle to happen it has never happened, but now they bottom down. And uh, unless Ukraine takes an action on this, I think there is a recognition by the political leadership, and it is going down the hill. So we see a renewed, uh, not interest, but commitment out of no other option. So they have to do it. Otherwise, also, the Western nations will not be coming to the aid of Ukraine. And that's the case. So one shouldn't wait until then, either you know, oil prices coming down to the bottom or you lose all other options, then only thing to do is to reform. So reform should come as a result of also uh, a common consensus in the society. So you need to consult not only government leaders, parties, but also 
business community which will be providing the funding and operating your energy facilities, but also civil society who are sensitive about environmental issues, community issues, and also in conjunction with the international organizations like IEA, IEF, uh, Energy Charter, World Bank, uh, ADB. And so uh, my last word, I'm sure there will be more uh, occasion to uh, discuss our matters, is there is a huge potential for reform, for opening the way for investment, trading flows, also technology exchange. I mean, advanced technology will not come unless you have intellectual property right protection in your country, unless you pay for what you develop and you just to uh, protect your property rights, trademarks. And uh, one, one final word, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what about India? You were pinpointing towards uh, the audience as well. Uh, I forgot to mention it, but also we are, since we are talking about emerging economy, so, uh, economies, sometimes we tend to forget the place of India with its rising demographic uh, clout on, uh, on the global stage. And uh, since we were mentioning uh, that the competition for resources is increasing at the global level, we went all, uh, all the way to Arctic and uh, uh, the, the seabed, uh, uh, what, where do you see India staying? I think you're right. We often uh, neglect India. It's a small country of about 1.1 billion almost, and which will be, I think, uh, overtaking China by 2035-40 in terms of population. And India also is very proud of declaring itself as the world's largest democracy. Probably this is one of the setbacks why they cannot be so efficient. Yeah because a country like China, under the strict control of one party leadership, and uh, the president combining five functions in himself, including the military leadership, the party presidents, and economic. And India uh, has a great potential, and it might be taking over some of the low end of manufacturing uh, that China is leaving behind, because China is moving into what they call Made in China 2025 very high end of technology. They are spending more than OECD countries in R&D. Whereas I think India will be following as a laggard from behind. If India could be taking over what China is doing today uh, for the next 10 years, I think it's going to be a huge benefit. But energy security wise, India is in a worse position than China. They heavily depend on imports and they don't have solid sources of energy, be in oil or gas. That's the reason why we discuss about the TAPI project coming from Turkmenistan via Afghanistan, Pakistan. That's a, some people call it pipe dream, you know, going through Kandahar and Pakistan and India. And also Iran, uh, Pakistan, India interconnector. And they are also paying a very heavy price for LNG that they get from. So uh, in India, the reforms, both international dimension and domestically, are daunting and very challenging. And the way India is organized will make it difficult to have efficient reforms uh, undertaken and implemented uh, effectively, I'm afraid. And for my country, perhaps I can say a few words about Turkey. That's a country also which has been going through the reform process in terms of reorganize, reorganizing its energy industries and organizations, unbundling uh, Botash, the natural gas monopoly, and uh, the price regime, tariffs for electricity, and uh, it's an ongoing process. But I, perhaps it's politically incorrect to say about that, but I'm tempted to believe that you shouldn't only rely on market forces for energy. Energy is not a market force based commodity only. It has so much political and strategic connotations. Therefore, uh, I would argue that um, so the energy champions idea as well in the countries. So if you treat uh, energy, in ideal world this will be great, determined by demand and supply. So the price is determined that way as well, no subsidies and ignoring social implications. And so we have to find the right balance between the market forces and the social needs as well as strategic uh, imperatives.